Straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. The retrial of an Iowa mother accused of strangling her daughter with a pair of pajama pants. Was it murder or an accident? It's like crushing a little flower. Our experts weigh in. Plus, a court appearance for the man accused of murdering his CEO boss, then dismembering the body in a luxury Manhattan apartment. And the woman charged with falsely reporting an attack by a black man in New York's Central Park is trying to avoid jail time. Law & Crime Daily covers court cases from coast to coast. to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Aaron Keller along with Brian Buckmeyer and Terry Austin. A plea deal appears in the works for the New York woman captured on video calling 911 on a black man in Central Park. Sir, I'm asking you to stop. Please don't come close to me. Sir, I'm asking you to stop recording me. Please don't come close to me. Please take your phone off. Please don't come close to me. I'm taking a picture of calling the cops. Please, please call the cops. Please call the cops. I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. Please tell them whatever you like. I'm being threatened by a man in the ramble. Please send the cops immediately. Amy Cooper appeared before a judge by a video conference, and we've learned she might settle her case by agreeing to community service. If such a deal happens, it won't be finalized until Cooper's next court appearance about a month from now. We've also learned that Cooper called the police not once, but twice the day of this video, claiming a black man named Chris Cooper had, in her words, tried to assault her. When police arrived, however, Amy Cooper admitted that Chris Cooper, who recorded the video, had not tried to assault her or even tried to touch her. Chris and Amy are, of course, not related, despite having the same last name. Everybody's seen the video. Everybody's talked about this case, so we, of course, will as well. Brian, the charge here is falsely reporting an incident in the third degree. It's a Class A misdemeanor. What could that mean for Amy Cooper? Legally, a Class A misdemeanor is punishable by up to a year in jail. But actually, how this plays out in most of the five boroughs of New York, you're looking at a reduced charge, probably to a violation of disorderly conduct and some amount of community service, depending on what the sides negotiate. So Terry, Chris Cooper, who recorded the video we just saw, did not support the New York District Attorney's decision to try to move forward with this case. He backed away from it, said she's gotten enough punishment from the public shaming, social media comments and whatnot. My question legally, though, is does this proposed punishment of community service fit the crime given the outrage? I think it does not fit the crime. The DA's office actually said that the objective was to have the proposed punishment educate both Ms. Cooper and the community. But I actually think that the punishment should include more accountability for her specific actions. This incident really could have gone south fairly quickly. We've seen that happen in the past, and people could have been injured, or even worse yet, people could have died. Brian, in your opinion, does the punishment fit the crime? Normally, you're in the position of defending people like Amy Cooper. Exactly. When I look at other Class A misdemeanors and how they actually play out in Brooklyn or other areas in the five boroughs, it does actually fit. When you're talking about the level of the crime, this is typically what happens with Class A misdemeanors or people who do not have large or any criminal history. I do see Terry's point as to the ifs and maybes that could have occurred, but if you're applying them all the same way, it, it's pretty par for the course. And the law operates the way the law operates. Great analysis, Terry and Brian. Testimony has slammed to a halt in the Kelsey Thomas murder trial. She's the Iowa mother accused of strangling and killing her little girl using a pair of pajamas. A jury acquitted Thomas in March of a lesser count of child endangerment resulting in death. But the jury hung on first-degree murder, which carries a mandatory life sentence. It's the more serious charge. Thomas is being tried again, this time in front of just the judge. Prosecutors put the case on hold after calling just three witnesses. Terry Austin's here to bring us up to speed on one of those witnesses. Terry? Aaron, prosecutors called the investigator who interviewed the defendant in 2018. He testified from the jury box as a COVID-19 precaution. The agent said Thomas was free to go at any point during the half, five and a half hours of questioning. It was really... Uh we call it a cognitive style of interviewing. Uh, I simply would ask her to, uh, so I'd start the interview by asking her to go through the day's events, kind of tell me a story uh, about what happened in her best words, using the most recollection that she can. Um, the goal is to let that individual talk as much as she can so I can get an understanding of what happened since I had never been in the home and I had never talked to her before. I'm trying to indicate something in the, during that interview about wanting to leave. I think at one point she, she did state that she wanted to leave, and I recall that we said, well, there's the door. You're welcome to leave. And did she leave that? 
She did not. The agent says he interviewed the defendant again two days later. If I recall, the, the bulk of the conversation we had with the defendant was the scenario in which she sh said how the child was found um, when she came into the bedroom with what we saw as physical evidence or what the medical examiner had provided to us as information of if that act hanging in the closet by pajama pants was plausible or not. Um, at some point, um, did the defendant change her story um, and confess to um, killing her daughter? She did. After that uh, portion of the interview, did she ever recant to you? No. Did she ever take any of the, uh, what she had said then back? No, she did not. At some point, did you provide um, the defendant a sheet of paper to write something down? I did. After she had confessed to, to killing her child, we, we left the room for a little bit. She was alone. I offered her a piece of paper and said, would you like to write down your thoughts? People are going to have questions of what happened here. Or would you want to tell people what happened? Um, she took that opportunity and did write a letter. Eventually, that same investigator testified that he met with the medical examiner who had serious issues with how the evidence compared with Kelsey Thomas's claim that Chloe's death was an accident. Aaron? Thanks a lot for that report, Terry. Law and crime expert and professor of forensics Joseph Scott Morgan analyzed the autopsy photos and demonstrated possible scenarios on how the victim's injuries could have occurred. The markings that are left on the neck, are they consistent uh, with, say, this child being in a suspended space, uh, suspending an air and creating, we call it a tinting effect, where if you imagine this is the head, where it goes up sharply like this, as opposed to, say, a ligature strangulation that runs more parallel to the shoulders. So are these markings on the neck consistent? If, if you're going to strangulate your own child, the reality of this uh, is the fact that you have to, under most circumstances, stare them in the face as you're doing it, uh, where you're on top of them throttling this child. It can be <clears throat> accomplished from the rear, uh, but many times, you know, we have this vision of an individual that is on top of, of the victim. Uh, you know, she would so overpower this child. This is not like adult on adult. You know, just look at her. She's this dainty little angel. Um, it's not going to take too much to overcome her. And still ahead here on Law & Crime Daily, the state's final witness in the Kelsey Thomas trial. Is it evidence of murder or is it simply inconclusive? We'll let you decide. And later on, this man's accused of playing a role in the murders of eight people. Find out why he's writing to the judge from behind bars while he awaits trial. Law & Crime Daily will be right back. Let's head back to court for more testimony from the trial of Kelsey Thomas, the Iowa mother accused of murdering her five-year-old daughter by strangling her to death. Kelsey Thomas says the girl died by accidental hanging. But Kelsey Thomas also confessed after authorities confronted her with an autopsy. Was it a false confession? Brian Buckmeyer takes us through testimony from the final witness from the prosecution who described clues that something just didn't feel right about his interactions with the defendant. Brian. Yes, Aaron. So a criminal investigator testified that Thomas's claim that Chloe died accidentally just didn't make sense, in part based on Thomas's own demeanor. One of those was with um, the manner in which uh, Miss Thomas described how she had found her daughter hanging, yet when she removed her daughter from those pants, the pants just simply fell off the dowel rod. Um, that was a, a point of concern for me. Uh, it seemed a little bit improbable. It seemed that if this was um, either an intentional act or an accidental act, as uh, Ms. Thomas was describing, um, it seemed like there would have been a lot of avenues uh, for Chloe to have gotten out of the situation she was in. Um, so I had a lot of questions about that. Um, I did note uh, that Ms. Thomas, um, through this walkthrough, um, it did strike me as odd that there really wasn't any emotion involved in this. Um, at this point, we were less than 24 hours removed um, from the death of her daughter, essentially, um, and there really wasn't any emotion uh, involved with this, essentially walking officers and investigators through how she found her daughter dead. 
The investigator also said that as Thomas walked him through her home, her description of how, close, how Chloe died didn't add up. Chloe, uh, while tying this knot, she would have had to have left enough room to fit her head in immediately, just to get her head in. And then on top of that, I can't say what the factor would have been, but those pants are going to stretch. It was very apparent to me that these pants were considerably stretched out. In my opinion, uh, based on all the measurements that were taken, we're almost to a point where Chloe would have been nearly touching the ground. I just found it hard to believe that her head would have just laid there and she, her, her muscles would have somehow just kept her head in those pants and not just, you know, her head flipped back, allowing her to fall out of that. There was just a, a lot of things that just didn't seem like it would have worked out the way she was describing. We really just felt strongly that what she was describing just was not plausible. There was a lot of information that had been looked to, into at that point um, that just led us to really strongly believe that, you know, we needed to, to really get to the bottom of the truth, essentially, um, which we believed was not what she was describing to us. So the same investigator followed up with that the Thomases the day after Chloe died and said he found the parents' behavior very odd. You noted a lack of emotion in Kelsey Thomas, correct? Correct. You noted that same lack of emotion in Aaron Thomas, her husband, too, correct? Yes. And ultimately, you don't believe Aaron Thomas was involved in the death of Chloe Chandler, correct? Correct. Aaron Thomas and Kelsey Thomas, from an emotional standpoint, essentially presented in a same or similar way to you, correct? I would say Aaron, um, when he spoke, um, he spoke uh, a little bit more abnormally. Um, I, it's hard for me to describe it. Um, it seemed like he had a little bit more of a, a little bit of a gut wrenching feeling. Um, but generally speaking, I didn't see any crying or anything like that from him. When Kelsey was describing ravioli coming out of Chloe's mouth during the walkthrough, Aaron laughed. Correct. Correct. Okay, Brian, so we've got police officers saying something didn't feel right. And look, I understand the, the human urge to, to basically just trust your instincts. But we hear testimony like this all the time. The question is, how should the defense deal with it when we're getting testimony that oftentimes hinges on a hunch? So I would say, the officer, keep your feelings to yourself. The only type of witnesses that can use the O word, that being opinion, are experts and experts in those fields. Joseph Scott Morgan, you can give your opinion all day long because you're an expert in that. When this officer is testifying that, well, I thought the pants would have stretched, or it's my opinion that her emotions were this, he's not a psychiatrist, he's not a forensic scientist, and that should have been dealt with motions and eliminated to allow him not to testify to that. Terry, it sounds like we better hire Brian if we ever need somebody to combat this testimony like this. But look, this is a trial by judge, not by jury. So the procedure just feels a little bit odd for those of us who watch trials all the time. Nobody gave an opening statement. The state called three witnesses and apparently plans to rest. The defense is calling one witness next week. We're hearing that there's going to be no closing argument. That puts the burden on the judge to read a lot of the files and make sense of all of this. Absolutely. She's got to pay close attention to what those files say. But remember, she actually was the judge who presided over the first trial. So she has the expertise to remember what the openings were, what the closings were, what the arguments were, and actually what all the other witnesses says. And when it boils right down to it, it is the medical exam that really matters here. Yeah, the whole case hinges on that medical examiner. Do people believe that testimony that the girl died at the hands of her mother or through an accident? That's what it hangs on, and the judge will have to make that decision. Well, let's move on to another case now. Nearly two years after an Ohio family was ultimately charged, a man was charged, rather, I should say, with the execution-style murders of another family, the patriarch charged wants a speedy trial. George Billy Wagner, his wife, and his two sons are charged with killing eight members of the Roden and Gilly families in Pike County in April 2016. Many of the victims were sleeping with children and infants nearby when they were killed. Prosecutors claim a custody dispute was the motive of all these killings. Wagners have pleaded not guilty and faced the possibility of the death penalty if they're convicted. Billy Wagner filed this two-page handwritten motion without help from his attorney asking for a speedy trial. His lawyers say they're still waiting for prosecutors to turn over discovery in the case. Yesterday, Wagner's lawyers filed a motion asking to withdraw what you're seeing on your screen. Wagner also si signed the motion to withdraw what he filed. 
He and his family have been held without bail since November 2018. And coming up after the break here on Law & Crime Daily, find out why prosecutors in Missouri decided to suddenly drop a pending murder case. And a man accused of murdering his CEO and dismembering the body appears in court. We'll have the details on that case when Law & Crime Daily continues. A former executive assistant to a tech CEO has pleaded not guilty to charges of first-degree murder for allegedly decapitating and dismembering his boss. Detectives say Fahim Saleh was attacked in his luxury New York City apartment. Saleh was an entrepreneur behind successful startups. Police announced the arrest of his assistant back in July. They say Tyrese Haspel owed his boss tens of thousands of dollars. Haspel is also facing charges of larceny, burglary, concealment of a corpse, and tampering with evidence. Here's how the NYPD described the gruesome murder. Mr. Fahim Saleh's cousin discovered his dismembered body in the living room of his apartment with his head, arms, and legs amputated. Upon further investigation, it was revealed that on Monday, July 13th, at approximately 1.45 p.m., Mrs. Salee was assaulted by Mr. Haspel with what appears to be a conductive energy weapon, better known as a taser, while exiting an elevator into his apartment. Other news now, a Missouri man is now free after spending 12 years behind bars. Prosecutors in that state allowed Donald Doc Nash to walk free because they say new evidence and revised expert opinions resulted in reasonable doubt in his case. Nash was convicted for killing Judy Spencer in 1982. Among the problems with the case, new technology revealed two new male DNA profiles on a shoelace used to strangle the victim. Neither of the profiles is those of Doc Nash. In Colorado, authorities say they've caught a killer who's been on the loose for almost 36 years in the murder of a 12-year-old girl. A grand jury has indicted Stephen Pankey of murder and kidnapping. They say he knew intimate details about the killing. Pankey is even a failed candidate for governor in Idaho, where he was arrested. The victim seen there, Janelle Matthews, was connected to the defendant through church. She was kidnapped, officials say, and shot in the head. When we come back here on Law & Crime Daily, an update on the case of a state's highest law enforcement officer under investigation for striking and killing a man with his car. Plus, a bizarre case out of northern New England involving the man police say is in that car on your screen, razor blades and a recall for pizza dough. Stick around for that. Personal Capital. A crazy case out of Maine where a former employee of a pizza dough company is accused of putting razor blades in dough for sale at a grocery store. 38-year-old Nicholas Mitchell waved at tradition after his arrest in neighboring New Hampshire. A store surveillance camera recorded a man who appeared to be Mitchell tampering with packages of dough. Mitchell faces several charges, including criminal threatening with a dangerous weapon and probation revocation. He was sentenced to two years in prison for a 20, in 2018, rather, for a separate incident. Incident. That's the probation situation. No injuries have been reported, and the Doe Company has issued a recall just to be safe. A police officer in Cincinnati finding herself on the wrong side of the law. A county grand jury there indicted Cynthia Souter on charges of theft in office and unauthorized use of property. Prosecutors say Souter stole less than $7,000 worth of items, such as wallets, from her department's lost and found. She's been a police officer since 1998. Her police powers have been suspended while the case proceeds. South Dakota officials have released a 911 call made by the attorney general of that state after he struck and killed a man with his vehicle. Jason Roundsburg called police around 1030 at night on September 12th, saying he thought he hit a deer. It turned out he struck and killed 55-year-old Joseph Beaver. A toxicology report taken some 15 hours after the crash reported no alcohol in the state attorney general system. According to the autopsy, the victim died of trauma consistent with a pedestrian motor vehicle crash. Roundsburg claims he searched that night in a ditch with his flashlight and didn't find anything. Well, Allie, I'm the attorney general, and I am, I don't know, I hit something. You I'm hit something. By Highmore. Highmore, and it's in the middle of the road. Ah, 
Okay, give me one second here. Let me get you a map. Do you know where you're at? I believe I'm by Highmore. I can, I'm right, I can see the town. Okay. I think that's Highmore. East or west? I just went to it. I am west. Are you injured at all, Jason? I am not, but my car sure as hell is. Oh, no. Okay, do you think it was a deer or something? Did you vomit I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> Terry, let's talk about this one really quickly. So the AG makes that call. He's got the toxicology test much, uh, m many hours in the future. But as to the investigation, it's important how the investigation is rolling out here. And you have some details on that. Right. I mean, listen, the good news is the investigation is not being handled by the attorney general's office. You heard that telephone call. Obviously, they're all very sympathetic to him. But the investigation, fortunately, because of potential conflicts is being handled by the South Dakota Highway Patrol and the North Dakota Bureau of Criminal Investigation. So that is good news. Hopefully the investigation will be as objective as possible. Yeah, trying to get a little bit of outside uh, agency uh, attention on it there. But again, it's the AG. So Brian, does the story make sense that this was an accident? The thing that I think that really helps this story make sense for the AG is the fact that he's saying he searched with officers. That, I think, is going to boost the credibility of the story, but it seems peculiar that they couldn't find anything or anyone. Yeah, I mean, having the police there, they couldn't find anything either. Maybe that will ultimately be the saving grace for the AG if you're on his side. Thanks for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time for our discussions about justice. Hi, I'm Dan Abrams. In the exploding legal and true crime genre, Law and Crime is the only network that has it all. Good evening and welcome. This is a complicated case. Don't really jump to conclusions. We break down the case of a serial killer. Another day of drama between both sides. From multiple live trials daily to original and compelling programming, the Law and Crime Network is everywhere. And we invite you inside the jury box. This is Law and Crime.